Jack Hilly set out the prize for the foot race. And the first thing was a silver mixing bowl. It was very well made. Now, it only held six measures, but let me tell you, this is the most beautiful mixing bowl on the whole planet. Okay, it was the Sidonians who are very good at making intricate things that had made it, and it was the Phoenicians that carried it across the misty sea, and then they set it up in a harbor, and they gave it as a gift to Thoas, and then it was Jason's son, Eunaeus, who gave it to the hero, Patroclus, in exchange for Priam's son, Lycaon. Anybody remember that? <laughs> So now this was the prize that Achilles set for his dead friend's funeral games and the foot race. And then he stood up in the middle of everyone and he said, come now, Argives, which one of you will try for this prize? And right away, it was fast, oily and Ajax that was the first to stand up. Then it was super smart Odysseus. Then it was Nestor's kid, Antilochus. Now Antilochus, he always won the foot races with the young men anyway. And now, when they were all lined up, that's when Achilles set the course. <laughs> and they're off! <laughs> Now, it's Oily and Ajax, whose fast feet are carrying him way out in front now. But Odysseus is following fast behind. But now, what's the distance between them? It's not far at all. Do you know that Odysseus is so close behind Ajax? When a woman is weaving with her rod, and she suddenly pulls the rod away from the warp of the weave towards her chest, that's how close now Odysseus was to Ajax as he was running. He was running so fast that he was actually falling in his footsteps, Ajax's footsteps, before the dust settled. Now Odysseus was breathing down Ajax's head. And then in the last leg of the race, as they're going, that's when Odysseus decided to pray, Athena, help me be a good helper to these feet. And Athena heard him. So now, just as Ajax was about to get first prize, Athena took battle fury and made Odysseus' feet and hands and all of his limbs light and fast. And she messed up Ajax so that he tripped. Oh! And he fell in shit. <laughs> All the shit that's lying around from the bellowing cows that Achilles killed for Patroclus' funeral pyre. And so it's in his mouth and it's in his nose. And Odysseus goes and takes first prize. And then Ajax takes the cow. I forgot to tell you about the cow. <laughs> Fuck! Second prize is a cow, thick with fat. Third prize is a half a talent of gold. Whoo, lordy, I'm sorry. Anyway, now Ajax, because he tripped, he's got to get second prize. So he gets the cow, and he puts his hand on the horn of the cow from the field, and he spits out the shit from his mouth. And I really love that the Greek word for spit is ptuo. Yes! <laughs> and he says to all of the Argives, Oh, Papoy, come on. This goddess over here messed up my feet. You know, she's always just hanging around Odysseus and helping him out like she's his mama. <laughs> That's what he said. And everyone sweetly laughed at him. <laughs> And then Antilochus came and he took last prize with a smile. And he stood there and he said to everyone, <clears throat> now I want to say something that all of you already know, that the gods, they honor older men more. Okay, look, 
Ajax. Ajax is only a little bit older than me, but this Odysseus, oh my god. I mean, he is a whole other generation. He's like one of the first men. Okay, some people say that his age, old age, is a raw old age, but you know, still none of these Achaeans can match him in the foot race, can they? Except maybe you, Achilles. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said, and he heaped the kudos on Achilles, and Achilles said back to him, Antilochus, this praise that you have given me does not go unnoticed, but I'm giving you another half talent of gold. <laughs> So he handed it to him, and Antilochus took it and was so happy. Thank you. <sighs> Next contest. Now, he set out a spear, a long shadow spear, and a shield, and, and a helmet. All of the armor actually of Sarpedon. Sarpedon that Patroclus killed and stripped him of. And then, then he called out to everyone and said, now let two men come forward, two who are the best at fighting in the close combat. Now I want you to arm yourselves and rush against one another, trying to stab each other with the skin slicing bronze. And whoever is able to get through the beautiful skin, to get inside it, to touch the entrails and the black blood, well, that person, I am going to give a big Thracian sword that I stole from Master Apias. Because <laughs> I killed him. Anybody remember? <laughs> and the rest of this armor can be split up between both contestants. And I'm also going to make them a really nice dinner in my tent. <laughs> That's what he said. And right away now, huge Telamonian Ajax came forward ready to fight, and he armed. And on the other side, it was big, strong Tidius's son, Diomedes. Now on both sides, they put on their armor, and they got ready to fight. Fight. They were looking at each other so terribly that all of the Achaeans were amazed. Now, they were rushing at one another three times. They rushed at each other, throwing themselves against one another. And it was huge Telamonian Ajax that was stabbing Diomedes in his perfectly round shield, but he was not able to stab through the beautiful skin because his breastplate protected him. But Diomedes, son of Tidius, he came and he was able to get his spear over huge Ajax's shield so that the shining spear point was just able to hit Ajax's neck. And then all of the Achaeans were so scared for Ajax that they stopped the combat. And they just split up the armor between the two of them. <laughs> but Achilles still gave that huge silver studded sword, the Thracian sword, to Diomedes. And along with it, it's scabbard and a really well-cut leather belt that it hang on. It's really nice. It's a whole set. <laughs> Next, Achilles laid out a massive piece of iron. That's right. Precious metals, people. We're in the archaic period. Now, this had been a throwing stone for huge, strong Etion, but then, of course, Achilles killed Etion. <laughs> and stole it along with all of his other stuff in his boats. <clears throat> so now Achilles placed this out and said, who now is going to try for this prize? Even though all of your farms are very far away from here, now whoever wins this iron, this will last them for at least five years in a row. You will never have to have your shepherd or your plowsman go into the city to buy more iron. This will provide. That's what he said. And the first person to come up 
was Polypoetes, who always stands fast in war. And then it was powerful Leontius. Then it was huge Telamonian Ajax. And finally, it was brilliant Apeus. Now, when they all got in a line, it was Apeus who was the first to take up the massive piece of iron. And he whirled round and he threw. <laughs> And all the Achaeans laughed. <laughs> Second, it was powerful Leontius, and he threw. And we have no idea what happened. We don't know. We don't, that's just it. Okay, and then huge Telamonian Ajax comes, and he throws, and his throw goes so much farther than all of the other marks they've had so far. And everyone shouts. <laughs> but then Polypoetes comes. Then huge Polypoetes comes and he throws. He throws so far. It's like when there's a shepherd who throws his whirling stick and the whirling stick goes all the way over his crops. <laughs> And they took that huge piece of iron back to his hollow ship. Next, Achilles set out some more dusky iron. This time he's got 10 axes and 10 half axes. Now, this is for the archery contest. And now, Achilles, he takes the mast of the blue seafaring ship and he ties it with a fine piece of line to the foot of a trembling dove, and then he sets up that mast in the sand. And he says, now, whoever can hit that bird, they get the axes. But whoever can only hit the fine line and misses the bird, well, they are worse. So they get the half axes. <laughs> That's what he said, and now, the archers came forward. First, it was the huge strength of Teucros, the son of Telamon. And then, then it was Meriones, who is Idomeneus' awesome sidekick. They shook lots to see who was going to be the first to shoot, and it was Teucer that won. So now, Teucer gets his bow ready, and he aims, but he completely does not at all, not at all promise Apollo that he's going to make a holy hecatomb where you kill 100 animals. And these specific animals are the firstborn male sheep. So he does not promise that. And so he shoots his bitter arrow, but he misses the bird because Apollo thinks that would be too much for him. And instead, he hits the string right beside the bird's Foot, so that now the bird goes flying up into heaven and the string falls down towards the ground. And everyone is pretty impressed. <laughs> and they clap. But then Mariones grabs up his bow and he gets ready to take his shot and he prays to the far shooter Apollo and he completely promises a whole hecatomb of the firstborn male sheep. And he takes his shot as the bird is whirling beneath the clouds and he hits it right in the middle between the wings. And the arrow goes straight through up into heaven and then lands at Mariona's feet. But the dove, the dove goes and sits on the top of the mast. Now its neck slumps over to one side and it's close flapping wings go limp. Now its life flies quickly out of its limbs and it falls from the top of the post all the way to the ground. Aww. And everyone is amazed and marvels at it. 
Side note, this is the last death in the Iliad. <laughs> So, Tuker gets the half axes, <laughs> and Mariones takes the full axes all the way back to his hollow ship. Now Achilles sets out another long shadow spear, and also a, a bowl, a cauldron, that has never touched the fire and that has beautiful flowery designs on it. And this is when the men who throw stand up. We imagine they throw spears. <laughs> the first to stand up is the son of Atreus, Agamemnon, the powerful lord of men. And on the other side, we have Meriones, Idomeneus' super awesome sidekick. And when Achilles sees them both, he says, son of Atreus, we all know how much better you are at throwing spears than everyone else here. You are just the best. So why don't you just take home first prize? <laughs> but we should still give this spear to Mariones. I mean, if you, if you think that's OK, because that's what I think you should do. And the son of Atreus, the lord of men, Agamemnon, listened and gave the spear to Mariones. And then Agamemnon took his prize to tell Thibius back to the hollow ships. And you get a prize! And you get a prize! You get a prize! Everybody gets a prize! <laughs> and then the games broke up. And all of the men, each man, scattered back to his own fast ship. And now they all turn their thoughts towards making dinner or towards sweet sleep. But Achilles, Achilles just wept as he kept remembering his dead friend, Patroclus. Sleep that is able to beat down everything else would not now take hold of Achilles. Instead, he tossed and he turned, longing for the manliness and the battle fury of Patroclus. And so, as he remembered, he thought about all of the things that they had done together, the painful experiences they had had, the painful battles they had fought, the waves that they had crossed. And as he remembered, now thick tears began to fall again. Now he would lie at one time on his side, and then at another time on his back, and at another time face first in the dust. And then finally, almost out of his mind, he would get up and walk along the shore of the sounding sea. Finally, dawn came, and he noticed when it brought light all across the land and across the sea, and that was when he decided to get Hector's body. He got Hector's body, and he tied it back up to his chariot and once again yoked his fast horses to his chariot, and now he dragged Hector's body three times around the burial mound of his friend Patroclus, Three times he dragged Hector's body. And then he stopped. And he went back inside his tent. And there he laid out Hector's body, stretched it out face first in the dust. But Apollo Apollo still defended Hector's body and would not let it be torn, would not let it decay. Now Apollo was always protecting Hector's body with the golden aegis. So it stayed fresh. But still, that's how Achilles always wanted to mutilate the body of Hector. And the gods, all the gods were watching this, and they pitied Hector's body. Now, they were trying to think about how maybe 
Ergafontes, Hermes might steal the corpse away, but that was not pleasing to all the gods, no. Especially not to the white-armed goddess Hera, or to earth-shaking Poseidon, or to the bright-eyed girl Athena. No, they were all still just as pissed as they had ever been at Ilion, at Priam, and Priam's sons and daughters and Priam's people, all because of Paris and how Paris had insulted the gods that day when those goddesses came to his forecourt to be judged. And that was when Paris only praised Aphrodite, the goddess that promised him destructive lust. So for 12 days now, every day at dawn, this is what happened. Until finally, Phoebus Apollo stood up amongst all of the gods, full of pity for Hector in his heart, and he said, you gods, you destructive gods, aren't you hard asses? Didn't Hector always sacrifice the cows for you? Didn't Hector always sacrifice those perfect goats? And now not one of you will dare to save his body, to save his body so that once again, his body can be seen by his parents, by his son, by his wife, by all his people who can give him the funeral rites of a funeral. No. Instead, you gods, you all want to help destructive Achilles. <laughs> Achilles has no thoughts of rightness in his mind. His heart can't be bent. Now Achilles, he is like a savage lion who has given in to his own manliness and to his own rage. And so he goes among the flocks of men and makes a feast of them. Achilles has killed pity. Achilles has killed shame. And shame is both a benefit and a harm to men, but someone closer than Someone like Patroclus will someday die. Maybe it will be a brother from another womb. Maybe it will be a son. And what happens then? Then we cry, and they will grieve. But then a man has to let it go. I mean, the fates gave mankind a heart that knows how to endure. But this Achilles, this Achilles just drags Hector's body around Patroclus's tomb day after day. And nothing is more beautiful for him because of it. And nothing is better for him. And all of us gods, we should resent this behavior because this mutilates the silent earth itself. So that's what he said. And the white-armed goddess Hera answered, <clears throat> Far shooter. <sighs> Look, your argument only works if you think that Hector and Achilles are equal. I don't think so, okay? Hector was born to a human woman. He breastfed. <laughs> Achilles' mom is a goddess, okay? I know because I raised her and I reared her in my own halls and I gave her away in marriage to Peleus, who all the gods love the most. So... You all were there, remember? The wedding of Peleus and Thetis? All of you gods were there, even you, Apollo. <clears throat> you were playing your guitar, I remember. <laughs> you who are the worst friend ever and so untrustworthy. That's what she said. And now, Zeus the cloud gatherer spoke. <laughs> Hera! It is not right for you to be angry at the gods like this. Oh, God. Did I forget? Oh, God. Yes. I did forget. <laughs> um, ah, yes. Hera, it is not right for you to be angry at the other gods like this. Nobody here is trying to say that Achilles and Hector are equals. But most of the gods here really loved Hector. You have to think about the fact that he was loved most of all of the men that were in Ilion, and I especially loved him because he never left my altars wanting. He always gave me my fair share. 
of the sacrificial smoke, of the libations. I mean, these are the gifts that gods live for. <laughs> now, as far as this plan about stealing Hector's body, that's a no-go. I think it would be totally impossible to get brilliant Hector away from Achilles in secret. But come now, let's get one of the gods to go down, down to Thetis, and have her maybe talk to her son and see if he will accept gifts from Priam and release Hector. That's what he said. And right away, fast-footed Iris, she went down, down from the peaks of Mount Olympus, all the way between Samos and Rocky Imbrios, through the black water of the harbor so that the entire harbor echoed with her splash. She sunk now like a piece of lead, a piece of lead that is sometimes gilded around the horns of a cow and then sinks to the sea, bringing death to raw flesh-eating fishes. That's how she sank, <laughs> down to the bottom. And she found Thetis down in her hollow cave, and all around her were all of the other sea nymphs, and Thetis herself was sitting there, and she was crying and crying over the fate of her blameless son, that he was going to die in fertile Troy, so far away from his fatherland. And Iris came and stood next to her and said, Thetis, now Zeus calls you, so you have to get up. <laughs> and Thetis said, why? Why do I have to go? Now I am scared to go among all of the immortals when my grief is so pure. But still, I will go because Zeus's orders should never be left in vain. And so the two of them went all the way through the dark water and the waves washed all around them and then they broke through the surface of the water and they landed on the shore of the sea and then they got onto the beach and they shot up into heaven and they went all the way to Mount Olympus. And there was Father Zeus and he was sitting with all of his God's sons, God sons and you know, the, all the other gods who are mostly his kids. <laughs> they were all sitting there and that's where they gave up a seat for Thetis. It was actually Athena, but you can, you're fine, you're there. And that's when Hera came over and gave her a cup and Thetis took it and drank. And that's when cloud-gathering Zeus spoke to her and said, Thetis, now you have come to Mount Olympus as troubled as you are, and I know you have so much grief, unforgettable grief in your heart. I know this myself. So I will tell you why I've called you here. Now for nine days the gods have had a fight over the body of brilliant Hector and the city sacker Achilles. Now there has been some talk of stealing Hector's body away from Achilles, but I, I want to continue to honor Achilles because I respect our friendship. I want it to carry on just as it always has been. But come, can you go down to your son and please tell him that all of the gods are annoyed with him now, and especially me, that he will not let Hector go and keeps him beside the beach ships. Maybe he will be scared of me. Maybe he will let Hector go. Will you do this? That's what he said. And right away, Thetis came down from the peaks of Mount Olympus and found the tent of her son. Hi, Mom. <laughs> and she said to him, <laughs> Achilles, how long are you going to cry and grieve over Patroclus? How long are you going to go without food and without sleep? You know, it is good to have sex with a woman. <laughs> You are not long for this life where I will still know you because now death and powerful fate stand close to you. But come, now you have to listen to me because I am a messenger from Zeus. 
And he says now that all of the gods are very annoyed with you, and he especially is angry with you because you hold Hector here by the beaked ships and will not let him go. So please, accept shining gifts. Let Hector be ransomed by Priam. That's what she said. And fast-footed, brilliant Achilles answered and said, I guess this could work. If someone brought me gifts, I would let Hector go. Because Zeus, the thunderer, orders me. So that's how the mother and the son were talking to each other on the beach beside all of the gathered ships. But now the son of Kronos, Zeus, sent Iris. He sent for Iris and said, Iris, fast-footed Iris, now I want you to go down to Priam. And I want you to give him this message so that he will go beside the Achaean ships and he will ransom Hector, bringing many shining gifts to Achilles so that his heart might be softened. And let him go alone. Let no other Trojan go with him except for one herald. And he has to be an older man, but not so old that he can't drive the well-running, half-assed wagon well, straight back into the city carrying the corpse that brilliant Achilles killed. And let him have no thought of fear or death in his mind, because I will send such a guide with him, Argifontes, Hermes. That's right. And he will take him to Achilles' tent, and once he's at Achilles' tent, Achilles himself will not kill Priam, and he will defend him from everyone else, because Achilles is not careless, he is not thoughtless, he is not a villain, but Achilles will gently spare any man who supplicates him. And I'm like, him? <laughs> That's what Zeus said, and right away, Iris, fast-footed, went. She went all the way down from the peaks of Mount Olympus, and she went to Priam's house, and there she found grief and screaming. All of Priam's children were sitting around the courtyard. They were crying so much that their clothes were soaked in tears, and Priam himself he was sitting in the middle of them. He was cloaked in a heavy mantle, and he had shit all over his neck and on top of his head. He had heaped it there with his hands. He had rolled around in it. And all of his daughters and daughters-in-law, they sat around and they wept. They wept for all of the good and awesome men that had been cut down by the hands of the Achaeans. And so now Iris came and stood next to Priam and gave, her, gave him the message in a little voice, but he was shaking all over and said, Son of Dardanos, Priam, don't be scared. Okay, I'm not thinking anything bad. I'm not going to do anything bad. I'm only here for good because I am a messenger from Zeus. Now, Zeus orders you to go beside the Achaean ships and to immediately ransom Hector's body, carrying many shining gifts to Achilles so that his heart will be softened. And you are supposed to go alone, and you are not supposed to have any other Trojan man go with you except for one herald, and he has to be an older man, but still young enough so that he can drive straight the well-running, half-assed wagon, carrying the corpse that brilliant Achilles killed. Uh, and... Um, Yes, let no thought of fear or death come into your mind because uh, Zeus is sending you such a guide, Hermes, and he is going to take you straight to Achilles' tent, and once you are in Achilles' tent, Achilles himself is not going to kill you, and he is going to protect you from all the others because Achilles, he is not thoughtless or careless or a villain, but Achilles, he will very gently spare any man who supplicates him. That's what she said, and she went away. <laughs> and now Priam, he went right away to get the well-running wagon ready, and then he went, no, he ordered his sons to get the well-running wagon ready. That's an important detail in a minute. We'll see why. <laughs> 
And then he went himself into the high ceilinged, beautiful treasury, and it smelled so good because it was completely lined with cedar. And once he was there, he called out to his wife, Daimonier, come, come here. Look, I have just had a, a messenger from Zeus, and they have told me to go beside the Achaean ships and to ransom our son Hector and to carry many shining gifts to Achilles so that his heart might be softened. But come, tell me what you think of this, because my own heart and my spirit compel me to go now to the ships through the wide army of the Achaeans. That's what he said. And his wife, Hecabe, she screamed. And she answered, ha! Oh, I, my Priam! Now, where has that intelligence that you were supposed to be so famous for gone to? You know, all the foreigners and all the men that you rule love you for that, and now it's like you've gone out of your mind. You want to go alone to look Achilles in the face? Achilles, who has killed so many and so excellent of your sons? Well, your heart is like iron. Oh, no. <laughs> Dryer. <laughs> your heart is like iron, because the minute that he lays eyes on you, you know what's going to happen. He is going to kill you. He's not going to pity you. He's not going to respect you. Achilles is a raw meat eater. He is a savage. He is untrustworthy. Now, now we should just accept our fate the fate that was spun for Hector from the day that he was born, and I bore him, that he is to be fed on by the flash-footed dogs far from us, and we have to grieve for him from a distance. He was killed by a more powerful man, by Achilles. I wish the heart in me would drive me to eat out his liver for what he's done to me. He has killed my son, not while he was being a coward, but while Hector took a stand in front of all of the Trojans and the Trojan women with their deep chests. And he had no thought in his mind of flight or of fear. That's what Hecabe said. But the old man Priam, who was like a god, said, you cannot hold me back. I really want to go. You cannot be like a bad bird in this house. You will not convince me, because if it had been some earthly messenger that came, if it had been some seer or some person who reads livers or some priest, then maybe we could ignore this advice and we could turn our backs on it. But I saw this goddess. I saw her with my own eyes. I heard her. I heard the message. So what? Maybe it is my fate to die beside the Achaean ships. I don't care, I want that. Then at least Achilles would kill me, holding my son in my arms, finally quenching my passion for grieving him. That's what Priam said. And now he opened up all of the lids, oh, excuse me, all of the lids of the chests in the treasury and began to pull out the gifts for Achilles. First, it was 12 awesome, super beautiful dresses. <laughs> then it was 12 mantles. Then it was 12 white cloaks. Then it was 12 rugs slash blankets. This is that tapis word again. Yes, that's right. Ancient Greek for rug is tapis. <laughs> then 12 Single ply, oh, I forgot the other ones were single ply mantles, just to let you know. Then 12 tunics. Then he measured out 10 talents of gold. Anybody remember what a talent is? The weight of a whole man's body. So this is a shitload of gold. <laughs> then two fiery tripods. Then four cauldrons. And finally, this super, super beautiful cup. This cup that the Thracians had given Priam as a gift when he came across the sea as an ambassador to them, even this super beautiful cup now, Priam did not want to leave among all of the things of the Trojans because he wanted so badly to ransom his son. And then he went out into the portico 
where all of the Trojans were crying, and he yelled at them, You insults! Why don't you go home? You have to come and cry here and trouble me further? Don't you know what fate I already have, that I have lost the best son, the best son, Hector? Don't you know how much easier it's going to be for all of the Achaeans to kill you now? At least for me, I will already see the house of Hades with my own eyes before this city is sacked and ransacked. And then the old man started beating them with a stick. And they all scattered in front of the old man's onslaught. And then he turned towards his sons with insults. All nine of them. There was Helenos and Paris, brilliant Agathon, Pamon, Antiphon, Polites with his great war cry, Deiphobus, Hippothous, brilliant Agaos. Now to all nine of these sons who by the way, still hadn't made the wagon ready. <clears throat> Priam shouted out his insults. Get out and hurry up, you insults, you wastrels. God, you know, I can't believe you are all that is left of me. I had the best sons in all of wide Troy, and not one of them is left. Not, not godlike Mestor, not Troilus, who had that horsey battle lust. Not Hector, who was like a god. I mean, people actually thought that his parents were gods. Now, Ares' battle has killed him. And I'm left with you. You insults. You liars. You dancers. You who are the best at leading the chorus. You who steal sheep and kids from your own people. I mean the goat kids, not the real kids. <laughs> Now hurry up and get the wagon ready and put all my stuff on it so I can go. That's what the old man said. And now all of the sons were terrified and they went and got the well-running half-assed wagon ready, which was also very beautiful and newly made. And they got down the yoke from its peg. Now this yoke was made of boxwood and not only was it really nice with uh, reins guides, rain guides for the reins, I don't know, they're guides for the reins on the yoke but it also has a huge knob in the middle. And then they went and they took down the yoke strap. Everyone's with me, right? We've all done this. <laughs> and you get the nine cubit long yoke strap. Now a cubit is this long, so nine cubits. We've got a lot to work with here. And then they take the well-polished pole and they fit it into the base. And then they put the rings on the peg of the pole. And then they take the yoke strap and they tie it round three times from either side, affixing it to the knob and making sure that the rings are properly placed. So now this yoke is all put together and they bring the whole well-polished, well-running, half-assed wagon out from the inner chambers. And then they harness to it these half-asses. Now these half-asses, yes, they're mules, but... <laughs> In Greek, it's half-ass is the literal word, so I'm going to keep saying it. <laughs> <laughs> These half-asses, they were a gift to Priam from the Mysians. And then Priam took some horses, and he actually hitched them up behind this well-running half-assed wagon. And these horses were horses that Priam had raised up in his own well-polished stables. <sighs> okay, so now... Priam and the herald, who was, of course, not too old, but old, Idaeus, were ready to go. And that's when Hecabe came running. Hecabe came running, holding a glass of wine in her, in her right hand. <laughs> and she ran over to him and she said, 
pour this out to Zeus before you go. See if he will keep you safe coming back from the hands of your enemies so that you can make it home alive. I need you to pray to the son of Kronos, to Zeus, who is up on Mount Ida and who looks over all of Troy and have him send you down a sign. Have him send you down a bird sign that is the fastest bird, the fastest and the best and the strongest bird and have him come on the right side so that you yourself can see with your own eyes that it is safe to go among the ships of the Danaeans with their fast baby horses. That's what she said. And Priam, Priam said, wife, I will do this because it is good to raise your hands to the gods and see if they will pity you. And so now right away an attendant comes and brings a, a big bowl for water and then they pour pure water into the bowl so that Priam can wash his hands because of course we all remember he's a little dirty. <laughs> And after he's washed his hands, that's when he takes the cup of wine and he pours it out. And then he lifts up both hands and he prays to Zeus, Zeus, Father, you who are highest and mightiest up on Mount Ida, please send a messenger and keep me safe so that I will know that I can come back from my enemies among the ships of the Achaeans. Send Send a bird that is the most powerful and the fastest of all the birds on the right side so that I can see it with my own eyes and I can know that I will come back again from the ships of the Danaeans who have very fast baby horses. That's what he said. And right away, Zeus heard him. And there was an eagle. It appeared. Oh, wait, over the right side of the city. Sorry, right, left dyslexic. There it was, and this was a huge black dusky or spotted eagle. <laughs> they call it a dark hunter, and its wingspan were such where, have you ever been to a rich guy's house with high ceilings and they've got these huge doors and you think about the height of the door, well that was exactly how the wingspan of this bird was now as it went swooping over the right side of the city and all of the people saw it and they were so delighted and they were just so happy in their hearts. So now that meant that Priam and Idaeus could set out. And so right away they drove the well-running half-ass wagon through the gates of... <laughs> through, through the echoing courtyard. <laughs> and it was Idaeus who was steering the wagon and it was Priam who was in the back with the horses. He was whipping them with his shining whip and all of their buddies were going along with them but they were all crying because they thought Priam was going to his death. And then when they got to the edge of the city and the great gates and went out into the plain, that's when all of Priam's sons and son-in-laws turned around and went back into the city. And so now it was just Adeus and Priam out on the plain. And Zeus, of course, wide-browed Zeus noticed them and he took pity on them and so right away he called to Hermes and said Hermes now you are the one who is the best companion when it comes to being a companion of men so now I want you to go down there and I want you to be a guide for Priam and I want you to make sure that no other one of the Danaeans sees or notices him until he makes it safely to the tent of Achilles who is Peleus' son. That's what he said. And right away Hermes listened to his dad. So Hermes puts on these very super beautiful golden ambrosial sandals on his feet. These are the sandals that let him fly across land, endless land and water. And then he gets a magic wand in his hand. This wand, <laughs> this wand that helps him charm the eyes of men. He can charm whoever he wants. And holding this wand and with his sandals, he flies all the way down to Troy and to the hellish spot. And that's where he disguises himself. Now he disguises himself as a young, handsome prince <laughs> who's just got his peach fuzz because that's the best time of youth. <laughs> Meanwhile, 
Priam and Adeus are making their way. Now they're just passing the tomb of Elios, and they bring the half asses and the horses up to a standstill so that they can water at the river. And now darkness has fallen over the whole land. And that's when Adeus sees Hermes coming. And he says to Priam, 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 you've got to pay attention now. This is something that you have got to pay attention to because there is a guy coming and I think he is going to just cut us into pieces really soon. So let's just jump on the horses and run away or we can grab him by the knees and beg him for our lives. <laughs> and Priam, now he's completely out of his wits. He's terrified. I mean, all of the hairs stand up over his gnarled limbs as he stares out into the darkness. But that's when Hermes comes. <laughs> and he grabs him by the hand and he says, Hey, Daddy-o. <laughs> so what are you doing out here in the dead of ambrosial night with these half-asses and these horses carrying all this stuff? Aren't you scared? of the fury-breathing Achaeans. You know, they're sleeping all around here now, and they are your enemies. What are you going to do with all this stuff? And I mean, who's going to defend you if something happens? You're old. That other guy's pretty old, too. I don't think he's going to be able to defend you, but don't worry, because <clears throat> I won't do anything bad to you, and I will defend you from anybody else, and I will be your guide. And Priam answered and said, oh, my son, well, everything that you've said is, is right, but the gods obviously have still given me some protection. They still hold their hands over me because they have sent such a guide as yourself. And you know, you are very handsome and you've got a great body. And um, you're obviously very wise, and so your parents must be very blessed. Well, old man. <laughs> yes, that's true. But uh, tell me now, where are you taking all of these things? Because are you taking them to some foreign land that's going to look after them for you? Have you now all deserted Holy Ilion because you're good, strong son, Hector, has died? I mean, he was never lacking in the battle against the Achaeans. And the old man Priam answered, Oh, my son, who are you and who are your parents? Because now you have spoken about my own son's doom and you have spoken so well of it. And Hermes answered again, <laughs> Well, old man, now you really test me out because I saw Hector fighting with my own eyes and he was a sight to see. I saw him pressing the Achaeans against their ships, killing them, cutting them down with the sharp bronze. But Achilles would not let us fight. He was too pissed off at Agamemnon. See, I'm his sidekick. I came here on the same boat as Achilles. I mean, I'm one of the Myrmidons. My dad's Polycter. He's a rich guy. He's old. He's like you. And he's got six sons, and I'm the seventh son, and we all drew lots to come to Troy. Yep, I, I drew the lots to come to Troy. So here I am, and I'm just making my way from the ships across the plain because soon the Achaeans are going to start up battle all around the city again because, you know, now I don't even think the Achaean kings can hold back those men. They are so eager for war. They have been sitting for too long. And the old man Priam said, My son, if, if what you say, if you are our Achilles sidekick, then tell me this and tell it true. Is my son still there? Is he still there beside Achilles' tent and ships? Or has Achilles cut him to pieces and fed him to the dogs? And the runner Hermes said, Old man, your son, he is still there. The dogs and the birds, they have not eaten him. No, every day Achilles at dawn drags him three times around the burial mound of his dead friend Patroclus. But 
But uh, Hector, his body is still lies there dewy now. There are no worms that eat him, the worms that always eat men who fall in battle. Now there is no decay at all. All of the wounds that happened when he was struck with the bronze have closed up and many men stabbed him. But no, there is some God who protects him now, who keeps him whole. And Priam, the old man who looked like a god, said, Oh, my son, so it is good then to give gifts to the immortal gods like my son did, if I had a son, because now the gods have remembered him even though he was dead. So come, my son, take, take this gold cup and guide me to Achilles' tent and keep me safe. And Hermes said, now, old man, you're just testing me. I'm not going to accept some cup without Achilles knowing. I mean, I don't want to be a thief. You don't steal from Achilles. I mean, something really bad could happen. <laughs> you know, like the whole Iliad. <laughs> <laughs> but I will be your guide. I will be a guide that will take you all the way back to Fertile Argus, over land and over sea. I will be such a guide that no one will come and fight with you because they blame your guide. That's what he said. And he jumped up into the wagon and he took the mast and the shining reins and now he blew battle fury and great strength into the horses and into the half asses so that they flew across the plain. Now, now they got to the ditch and the ramparts around the ships. And here all of the guards were just getting ready to make breakfast. But Hermes made them all fall asleep. <laughs> and then he opened up all of the locks and he threw open the gates around the Achaean camp. And he led Priam and all of the shining gifts for Achilles inside.